So this is a continuation of a few videos back where we worked together to break down and hang a um, elk that was killed on the road nearby here. If you want to see more of that, go check that out. So what are we doing today? Today we are going to butcher our elk that we showed you we got uh, 14 days ago, right? Yep. And, uh, and turn it into the packages that look like what you'd see in a grocery store. Okay, so what you doing here today? Well, first step, we've now hung this 14 days. And uh, now, like I said in the, in the first half of this, that uh, I leave that on there so I got clean meat underneath. And so now I got to take the hide off. And uh, this is uh, phase one. So basically now you got to skin each quarter. Yep. And if you had wanted to keep the entire hide intact for doing something with it, you would have had to skin that before quartering. But that wasn't our main goal. Burley wants to sniff the, the elk too. Um, he wants a little something too. But Now this is a front quarter, not that that makes any difference. I just, this happened to be the first one on the rack and so I... Uh, so I want to see if I can see what you're doing here. You're just following along, kind of peeling the the skin off up the leg so that then you can peel back from there with your skinning knife. Right? Yeah, and I'm not the best skinner in the world, you know. I'm sure people, if they're watching this, they're going, oh, you should do this or you should do that. But um, I get it done. It gets a little tight in places. I will have... You know, basically you get right up against the, the, uh, the hide as much as possible. So you're kind of cutting into the hide versus into the meat as you go. Yeah, if I was uh, uh, really good at it, I would uh, probably never nick the meat or anything like that. But uh, So if Micah stabilizes the other side of that, and then it doesn't swing on you while you're skinning. Is that helpful? It is. We'll do that. So I kind of, I'm going to kind of work this way and okay. kind of roll around and get it uh, coming off. Actually, if I can get the the uh, shank going and the rest of it. Then it kind of, you're peeling the fur back over itself. And so you keep most of the furs off of the meat that way. Yeah, watch your hand though. It keeps it real nice and clean. I uh, have been known to mess. And I'm sure you value your fingers a little bit. This gets a bit long, but Clay was really trying to detail everything he did here in case someone else was wanting to learn how to break down a big animal. If you are not that, you can go ahead and skip toward the end. Why you left the hide on? Tell me this again. Well, the reason I left the hide on was so, you know, this real thin meat, you can actually scrape that off, lay that off of the hide and actually make hamburger out of it. But where you can see Burley, he, <laughs> he likes it just fine. And so we just give him a chunk of hide and uh, he'll chew on it until it's gone. But by doing that, it protects all that meat. And that's what I was saying before, you know, this has been sitting here for 14 days and this looks like the day it was harvested, you know. Uh, it would look like that otherwise. Yeah, it would be real hard skin like that. See, that'll have to be filleted off, you know, when we're actually butchering. That'll, that'll be filleted off. And uh, so, yeah. And that's, that, that's does that cool. answer your question? Yep. So that's why you're hanging with the skin on. Somebody had asked on the last video about why you quarter it. That's basically just so it becomes the size you can handle because yeah. you can't pick a whole, you know, if you were set up as a commercial butcher shop, you could hang a whole carcass without chopping it into quarters because but, you're set but up. But they to do don't. That. They don't even do that. They'll have, and even on, a, you know, it's usually a guy that's pretty darn stout and he will come into the cooler. He, you know, it's on a rail, they can bring it close, but he'll grab the whole corner, you know, it, you know, in a bear hug and take it to the table and drop it and then everybody goes to work you know but th but they will quarter everything as well but the only real reason for quartering is creating a size you can handle moving around that's yeah. the point don't put that on the table where do you want it? well but it's all good because this is burly food here yeah you're, you don't and want so that on your food no that bucket there is burly food, burly food. yeah 
again, you know, it's really difficult to cut any meat off, obviously, while it's hanging like this. I don't generally do that. So I will take, and this shoulder is actually, believe it or not, not connected by any bones. This, this whole shoulder is, is all, uh, what do you call it? The, tissues, the, the tendons and, and uh, uh, sinewy stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's every, all that structure, and you'll see this as it starts to come apart here. So you're cutting right behind so the So you're, you're peeling off yeah. the back of the rib cage, yeah. right? And any little bits, if you guys are wondering, you know, that don't become a full steak or, you know, whatever, those all get trimmed so, up. So I will want you to be primarily hanging on to okay. this, so get back over here. So then we can... Uh, the little bits become ground meat and the bigger cuts become... We'll lay that on the table. You know, and, and I think it's important to say too, you know, this is the way I do it. I mean, it, it, it may be, you know, wrong for some people, but this works the best for me. And I've been doing it for many, many years and uh, this is just my system, you know. Like but, a lot of things. But you see how there's... There's no bone there, you know. There's the shoulder. We separated it without any any bones whatsoever. Uh, you know, it's just uh, now we have, you know, all these wonderful parts and uh, that'll be another uh, phase. So like on a, on a uh, beef quarter, the ribs, all this stuff in between is you know edible meat now i have known guys on elk and they will save that and make but they do it they cut the ribs out before they hang it like we just did here okay so uh, i'm just going to show you you can see from hanging it this way there's there's the rib. i'll take that right there normally that's where your ribs come from you know this upper part like if you buy ribs in a store this is where most of the meat is you know from uh, about this point up is where most and and that's uh, what I mean, this is the spine the th this is the spine and the other reason these are sticking out is because they were part of the broken yeah part of it. so i'm going to just show you i'm going to cut in between here on the ribs and just show you you know, it, it, and it doesn't go to waste, don't get me wrong, but it is super thin. I don't know if you can see that. There's nearly no meat on there, but for the animals, they love it. And so what we'll do is slice up those ribs and freeze them in chunks. And you can, you know, I don't know if you can see Burley, he's all excited. This is like his favorite, you know, uh, because, you know, the dogs love this. So we'll go through and peel off any thicker chunks of meat to put in our bin to create ground, ground meat out of. Yeah. And then the remaining little bits that are on, a, on the bone, because the ribs just aren't nearly as meaty as on a cow, that becomes dog food. And, and that is enjoyed very much by them. So while we're right here, I'll show you what I do with this. So this this is this portion right here this is the spine this is where it was split you can see that there is a beautiful chunk of meat right there and that i call it the top strap it's not technically correct but if you were to look like on a cow we have a cow up on the wall um you know it's part of the rib meat um i just call it strap because that's the way it's, it's the top end of what the back strap would be. It's the, the end of the back strap. And this will make some top. nice stakes up to about here. And then this up here is kind of a, I, uh, the way I put it on the packages, I'll say uh, 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 lower top and upper top uh, strap. And it'll be, you know, the back strap, this being the back strap. And, uh, you know, there's many, many different cuts when it comes to uh, uh, beef. But uh, with this, not so much. And this is the easiest for me, too. So I'll go right to the rib. I locate the ribs down there. And uh, see, these ribs come up and they tie into the spine. 
and so you want to you know make sure you're you're I guess you could call it filleting but you're right up against seeing as I peel that back you can see the ribs right there you know as I make that cut now if you were bone in you would slice that and then you would have the backbone in there with it and you'd have this beautiful looking steak uh, to me this is plenty beautiful just like it is but uh, for some people they want the bone in but it's not very practical for us because we're you know and most people aren't set up to cut with a uh, a bandsaw and all that you know just it's more tools and well, plus it saves a lot of space in the freezer if we're not keeping all the bones yeah you know. this here it's just you know it's good meat and we will grind that i will clean it up a little bit but we'll grind that up into uh, hamburger that actually is not ready to go in that bin. Correct, but, I know that. Okay. Well, we'll show them the trimming that up later. And this little piece right here is part of the neck meat. We've already taken that off. You can see here it's actually separate there. But anyway, I take that off and because it's not part of the the rib meat like that and then I'll continue with my uh filleting your strap out of there yeah and the closer you get to the neck you know the more sinewy it get it becomes and uh and when you go to clean these pieces um, you you will see it you'll when you have the piece laying out, out on the table this chunk here uh, you will see when it starts going toward the neck because there'll be more white strips going up and, through and which if is all that doesn't know sinew is like these white bits that hold the different layers of muscle together and let them move independently yeah. and all that and we will be pretty much trimming out all of the sinew because leaving that in is a, a part of what would create a very strong gamey flavor um, yeah. or give you those chewy chewy bits in your teeth when you're trying to chew something so you don't really want the sinew so we're going to trim all that out but what clay's doing right now is kind of the rough um, taking apart things into cuts and then we're going to go sit down at a table and work on the, the fine trimming up and if you're also if you're not familiar with this these ribs like these broken ones right here and all the, the rest of them here um, that's what's called edible bone it's a, a softer bone it wouldn't be soft for my teeth but if you're something like a dog yeah looking around the bones you know and it kind of just comes free as you you know and you just don't want to get in a hurry you just kind of work around each one of the bones and get little pieces at a time and and sometimes you you get into the meat a little bit but it's not the end of the world uh, especially for us because we've got so many uh, different critters that uh, want to eat this Burley's waiting very patiently to but back to what I was saying, the, the ribs are, unlike a femur bone or something, the dogs will fully eat the entire bone itself. If you're raw feeding dogs, um, a website like perfectlyrawsome.com is a good place to look for more info on that, but they need some edible bone. This is what any, you know, wild dog would eat in the wild. You know, if it's a big enough cat, like a mountain lion, like you guys got to watch, um, they would eat the ribs and such as well, and that entire bone will be consumed. So after we cut off all the big enough chunks of meat that we can grind, or turn into something like a, a strap, like that piece. That so, piece. there it is. You know, that was laying there with, you know, right after we skinned it. I took, this is the, the best piece of meat on the front quarter by far, this strap, and I have filleted that out. And here you can see, here's the line. 
So a lot of the meat will tell you, you know, as you're butchering, just, just follow the sinew lines. You know, you can see this line right here, it comes around right into here. And when you go, so this piece here is all premium, uh, you know, uh, uh, backstrap, which is part of the better part. And this gets into the neck meat. You can see all the different sinew layers right here. But that, when you go to fillet that off, you know, this will be one chunk, and then this will be ground up into hamburger. Okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. And the dogs will, we'll cut them up into smaller pieces, then, but the dogs will fully consume, you know, as we give them chunks, you know, in smaller pieces, they will fully consume the bone and any remaining meat that is on it. So now we're just continuing to cut out any little of the extra chunks of meat on there. This will all eventually turn into ground meat, um, you know, that you can get off the ribs, which as you can see, there's not much there when it's elk ribs. This is, even on a big elk, that would be true. That's one of the big differences between, say, doing a beef and doing an elk. I just feel for any soft spots, you know, having a little bit on, left on there, the, the dogs appreciate that, you know, so. Um, you know, short of not taking uh, too much time with it, but yeah. okay, so we're back to the rest of the, the front shoulder, which doesn't have you can go ahead. Okay, there's you know, this is a small elf, too, you know, but typically, what I do is you can see this is shank right here. This is part of the shank, then I'll go in right at the shank to the bone. And essentially, for me now, not for everybody, but for me, I don't like any of the steaks on the, on the front quarters, and so I prefer hamburger. In fact, if I had nothing but hamburger, I would be fine. Other than the very best cuts, then I want, uh, you know, the steaks from that. But, Hamburger is more important to me anyway, and so I just pretty much, my goal here is to remove the meat off of the front. That's all I'm doing, and I get big chunks and... Uh, Once again, you're kind of following where the bones go yeah. and where the sinew go, and, and just taking the, the meat apart the way it wants to come apart, basically. Yeah. Once again, you've cut into your hip bone there. And you just let the bone be your guide. And uh, the shank, every year we think, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'll show it to you what it looks like inside the shank, but it, there's there's some good hamburger in there, sure enough, but uh, it is so difficult to get out all the tendons and, and sinew that uh, typically it goes in, uh, you know, the dog food. Either that, or if you're going to cook it, you need to slow, slow cook it. Like we're talking 200 degrees for 12, 14 hours, and eventually all of that tough tendons and stuff will melt, and it will turn into meat candy. But you cannot rush it. I tried. It's terrible. It's yeah. like eating leather. <laughs> the first go around to doing that, it was uh, 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 just an exercise because it was not edible by the time we got done. But if you cook it really long and slow, you can make it very delicious. Yeah. Mm. And then once again, all these chunks, he's, he's kind of trimming off there. We're going to go trim up and get rid of the bits of sinew and stuff, and it'll be a whole bunch of little pieces to go into the meat grinder to create ground meat. Well, and I've got friends that uh, all of the front quarter meat is, where, is what they make uh, all their jerky out of because they're usually long strips and so you can strip it out and you know once you take the sinew out you can strip it out and they do those entire strips in lengths about like that of uh, jerky real jerky and it's done and seasoned and cured you know uh, in a slow process and uh, 
and we like jerky, but we use so much more ground meat because it's yeah. such a versatile thing in so many dishes that we tend to turn more of it into ground. But that's certainly another thing you could do with the cuts of meat up on the, the front end here. Maybe we will have a jerky making tutorial the way we do it. There's lots of ways to do it, like most things, but we most often do it using ground meat and then a, a jerky gun to form it into a long strip Barely. because no. that's the easiest to, to make and to chew and we're a little bit lazy that way. This is the shoulder blade, which uh, will go through all this, but uh, you know, this was, you know, comes around and it comes just off. This is the shoulder blade right here. And we'll clean that up and you'll see that a little bit better. But all these, these are all, uh, you know, sinew lines in there. Um, there is some nice meat in there, but uh, I don't choose to make steaks out of it. It's all, either jerky or hamburger, um, you know, cause it's just not a fun piece of meat to make a steak out of for me. Well, it ends up being a, such a small steak on an elk compared to a cow that it's hard to cook it as a steak without just burning it. Even on a nice slow grill. Yeah. And again, I just let the bone be my guide. I'm following it around. That would be the front knee joint you're seeing there now where the bone looks yeah. very rounded. And this uh, shoulder is going to pop off here in a minute. Because it's going to disconnect right there at the knee cartilage. Yeah. So that would be the knee knuckle. The shank is there. I'll cut that shank off. We'll show you that. And inside here is the uh, shoulder blade. actual shoulder blade. And we'll just clean that all up. And, ah. Again, hang on to it up here. Put it hang on down here too. Yeah, but watch your fingers. Once again, you're just following the bone to Mm -hmm. Get those chunks of meat off. And there's nice meat in there, but it's got these lines of sinew running through there. And some of it you can uh, fairly quick, you know, you don't really want that stuff in your uh, hamburger. Uh, that stuff, it'll make it more gamey, you know, so you try to eliminate all you can out of there. But uh, if you get most of it, it is absolutely pristine. And now bones like that bigger, you know, leg bone there, that is not an edible bone. The dogs are not going to be able to fully chew that bone. They will, however, chew any remaining bits of meat and tendon off of it and eat the marrow out of it. And then eventually the rest of the bone just kind of becomes a, a toy. But unlike something like the ribs where they eat the, the bone fully, that is not edible bone and they won't eat the whole thing. And you'll see that even walking around the woods with, you know, wild game that was killed by other wild animals. The, the pieces you'll find a while later are those bones. And that will be the only thing left. So Clay's just gonna continue to trim up some the little bits off there. Again, that's all gonna be going into ground meat and that's taking- Other than my fingers are frozen solid. So, <laughs> so we have a bucket of warm water to thaw, thaw your fingers out in. Um, but that's all just going to go into ground meat and that is taking apart the whole front quarter. So next we'll do a back. Okay, here before I even skin this, because it's such a small piece, but that's the tenderloin right there. And I probably should have taken it out uh, right after it was harvested, but I didn't. And uh, so now, I'm going to take it out after the fact. And again, it's all about following the bone. You know, keeping in mind that this is the most tender piece on this animal right here. And it's not going to be much because it's, you know, such a small animal. But uh, 
once again, it's, it's the cut that's kind of tucked in the curve of the spine there, and you're just kind of following the, the bone to peel it out, very much like the one we saw in the front quarter. Sorry about the camera angles, guys. It's a little hard sometimes to get my camera where you can see clearly when somebody's actually got to have their hands working at the same time. right up here going into the hind quarter right there. I'm going to separate it here and uh, try to extract that. And that may not be obvious to the carrot. There's a bone right behind there that you're hitting that mm -hmm. once again you're following. Yep. You can't necessarily see that from the front but you're just peeling it off the bone. And here's the bright side. Can't really go wrong. Worst case scenario, if you whack up a really good piece, you can always make hamburger out of it. You know, it's not the end of the world, but. But, but you'd be a little bit sad if you turned your back strap into hamburger and didn't have it to grill as a back strap. Yeah, but this but one. But it certainly wouldn't be lost. This one is so teeny. It'll probably take two of them to actually make a meal. So there, once again, when he peels that out, you can see the, the rib uh, or the spine, you know, bones in behind that's, there. Yeah, that's all bone right there. And that's the back strap. And that is probably one of the smallest back straps I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's pretty small. Where are you starting from now? Right, same place. Okay. Inside. My hand's safe up here then? Um, so now we're going back to getting getting the back quarter skinned because you could see the the kind of dried meat skin that formed on the front of the the meat that was exposed and so currently the hide is protecting all the rest of it. And you saw what I did there. I got a uh, skin and end on there and I just hooked it underneath there and then slid it up and sliced you know you can see the hide is sliced all the way through there and then you go to I try to get the the, uh, the whole upper leg skinned out and then uh, the lower part goes a lot easier because you got the weight of the hide pulling down as you are uh, skinning it. So some of this is not any right or wrong way. It's just the, the easiest way to work way. <laughs> and it may be completely wrong. I don't know, but it's the way I do it. It ends up as food that's edible, so it's the right way. <laughs> that's right. How old were you the first time you helped butcher uh, an animal that fed your family growing up? <laughs> well, as long as I can remember, we always, uh, you know, the kids were sitting at the table, you know, cutting off the sinew and, uh, you know, and my parents were, uh, um, cutting the pieces, you know, and uh, packaging. We did, you know, the kids would help package and, you know, all that. But uh, it didn't matter how young you were. Uh, you were always old enough to do something, I suppose, unless you were, you know, in a crib or something. Pretty much as soon as you were old enough to stand up or sit up by yourself. Yeah. You could play a part in it, and, and even the girls were were doing it. 
he didn't, it wasn't exactly their favorite job, but they like to eat just like we do, so if uh, you want to eat, uh, that's what you do. You help in the process of uh, And so the reason you're leaving that kind of tuft of fur up there at the top where the meat hook goes through the joint is because... Well, partly it's nearly impossible to get to be on the hook, but uh, the other part, there's, there's it's there's dog no, food anyway. There's no not, meat. It's really yeah. just a bone joint. Yeah. There's not really any muscle in there. No. If you guys can hear the chewing noises in the background, that's probably working on skinning any remaining bits off that first piece of hide. And the only reason you're not seeing Tana is because she is taking her beauty sleep nap. She doesn't, she gets very whiny if you keep her up all day. She wants to be put away where she can nap in peace. So that's oh, she would not be happy knowing we're doing this though, because she likes to be involved. But she takes all the pieces and she hides them in the shop corners, yeah. which is not ideal. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then you're going to find them later and they're going to be smelling. Yeah. So she's having her beauty sleep and she doesn't know we're skinning an elk, so she doesn't know that she's missing out on this. And yeah. she's happy to. She would not be pleased with us right now. Yeah. And once again, as you peel that backwards, then not only is gravity and the weight of the hide pulling it away, you're also mostly able to keep all the, there's always a few that we wipe off as we clean it later, but you're able to keep almost all the furs off of the meat. But not off of me. This is why we have a great big bucket of hot soapy water. Yeah. And you can see with uh, having my brother here to help hold the stuff, this is one of the things that he is making, filming this possibly because most of the time it's been Clay and I doing it by ourselves and all hands are needed and there's no one left to uh, operate a camera. But he's going to get some of the meat to eat and uh, he's helping us do this part. Are you getting some of the meat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sweet. Well by default because you come over and you eat it when it's cooked. <laughs> yeah, when I'm skinning, I'm not putting much pressure on that you notice I sometimes just have it in two fingers you want to just like barely touch it sometimes otherwise you go right into the meat also your knife is razor sharp yeah it's a little too sharp for skinning but um, it's it's fine on butchering day clay, clay keeps several knife sharpeners handy the whole time and these knives will get sharpened multiple times through the better day. Better pull back on this quarter. Oh yeah, no, just okay. Just keeping. You're doing beautifully. Just trying not to get my fingers cut. Yeah. Yeah, kind of watch out for me. I'll watch out for you if you watch out for me. I'm trying. So far, we're successful. And if you get a little nick, like you can see right here, the knife nicked into the meat just a bit, that's fine. You just move it over and you go back to just peeling the hide. Yeah, it don't hurt anything anyway, but you know, if you were skinning for a trophy animal up around the head, of course, you gotta be real careful with your, your skinning. That's it. For one, this wasn't a hunted animal, and for two, uh, you don't hunt for trophies, we hunt for food. We're pretty yeah. much never doing that kind of thing. But there would be a little different process if you were trying to fully cape out an animal to have a, a mount or something. This is how we do it for easiest meat production. Yeah, it would not be 
and over the rump right here in this area the hide tends to be uh, attached a little better and I got nicked into the meat just a little bit but not the end of the world back quarter is skimmed. Now of course these two operations will get repeated on the, the other quarters as well, but I'm not going to take the time to film all of that since that will be a, a near duplicate. You can see this line right here that is in on every animal that'll be there. And this is again where I start because again, it's being boned out. You're not cutting any particular steaks or anything like that. This is, you know, um, uh, my method and my method only. But so where I start, you know, and everybody's got to have a starting point and let's see, but when it's hanging, you go in right there, there's a knuckle right there that's bone. And you work around that and you, Try to get started and it'll loop around a little bit. That's why I'm, uh, you know, working the knife, you know, and then I'm gonna, now I'm on the bone in the back. Now I'm gonna rotate the knife like this. And you'll see, for whatever reason, that line is the line of the bone on how the hind quarter is made. And I take that piece like that. And that is round. It's the cut the cut is called round. It is technically round, but uh, it's a better part of the round, you know. Uh, uh, you know, so if you were buying a round roast at the grocery store, it would probably come out of a spot similar to this. It would come out of this, okay. you know, it would yeah. come out of the back side of that. Yeah, part. this is actually pretty good steaks right here. And some of the back end of the round we tend to turn into burger because it's a little bit of a dry steak on an elk. As you can see, there's almost no marbling in elk meat. So that comes out, that followed the bone all the way down. It's a lovely thing. The, uh, the white that you're seeing is bone, sinew, and such. There's almost no fat marbling in wild game meat as opposed to a, a corn-fed cow. This, what I do here, because this is all Pre, this is the premium meat other than the you know tenderloin that I took out but it's so small but this area from here on down is all premium you know some of the best you're going to get on the whole animal you know this being the the rump and uh, not that there's anything wrong with the rump it just uh, so I make a slice right here right and that's right at the joint yeah, and there's a bone right there, and I'll go around like this all the way to the spine, make that cut. Let's give you an idea just how to get it off. And then here, I'll make a cut right here. Clear to the bone, come from, around here. From the same joint you had originally started on. Yeah. Oh, don't put your fingers in there. Like that. Then I come back here and I take a seat because I like to because this gets to be a long day. It should be a little less long where this one is such a small elk, but when we've done some bigger ones, it's a, a very long day by the time we get done. So then I bone out that, um, what would that be, the femur? 
Yes, that would be the femur bone. And so this is the largest single. Because once again, you're looking at this upside down. This would have been the backbone and that would have been a back foot. If you can imagine it being turned right side up. I know there was other conversation going on at the same time. If you didn't catch the website, I recommend in here for more info on raw feeding animals like our cats and dogs, go to perfectlyrawsome.com. Should be it. And you can see what a large chunk of meat that is off a hindquarter compared to what came off the front end. And whether you have a bigger or smaller animal, that's going to be the same proportions. That's all the rump area. And then uh, I'll remove this. And that again came right apart at a joint. Yeah. And so this would be another chunk of shank, very much like the front end. Can be cooked into a good meal if you cook it very, very low and slow. Otherwise it makes excellent uh, ground meat if you want to spend a very long time trimming sinew out of it, or it makes excellent dog food. Not because there's anything wrong with the meat, there's just so many layers of sinew and tendon through that whole leg to make a leg work that uh, there's no big individual chunk of meat without all the multiple layers like hold that back over there for a sec you can see how even without cutting it how the different layers of meat are just sliding apart on their sinew layers yeah and you have to separate each one of those if you're gonna uh, be making hamburger out of it you know because you don't want that ground you can a lot of people do but it makes it more gamey So now you're back to just cutting off any little chunks of meat that there are to be trimmed up for making ground meat. As you go around that back, like the backwards knee, what would that be? The hawk on the, the back end of a four-legged creature? This is the hawk, yeah. Well, you got plenty to eat there, bub. Yeah. You've got your height. When you talk to Burley, he thumps his tail just so he knows, you know he's listening. Yeah. Okay, so now we got that, that was that front end of the rib cage off the back quarter. And Clay's gonna show what he does with that. Well, that's the front one, this is the back one. Right, Yeah. but it was the front uh, end of yeah. the back quarter. Okay. And just so you're oriented, long ways here would have been the, uh, the spine, and this is the hip joint. You can almost see the ball of the hip joint where the leg would have come out of. And again, it's all about following the ribs. Except you're on the opposite side of the ribs from where you peeled the back strap out. Correct. As long as I'm not blocking the camera view. You're fine, I'll just move the camera. So really, for breaking all of it down, you know, for almost every piece you're cutting off, you're simply finding a bow and following it until you run out of that piece. And then yeah. Again. You can't show that on the camera, but you can kind of feel where the bone is as you're doing this and try to work around it leave as little meat as possible in this section where this is uh, if you're gonna have any really good meat it's gonna be on this piece that's the tenderloin um, it's not that technically this is the tenderloin, the one we, the that we took out first right here. That would be the tenderloin that was there. 
and this is still part of the loin. This would be loin steak or I call it still backstrap. I call it all backstrap, you know, but that's just me. You can see all the spine nodules. Vertebrae. Yeah. And that's the lump you're taking off now? No, this is actually uh, uh, what would they call that? Uh, sirloin tip. I think that's oh, I see. okay. That so would be front of the. See, this is the tip, of, and, and we just took out the sirloin. Okay. The so first it's piece, and thing. this is the sirloin tip, which is below that. Um, very much a. And normally, if you were, you know, if you were purchasing this from a store, this would be all sliced up and there'd be a bone in there. And then you could lap your lips around it and uh, uh, clean off the bone, but uh, we don't have that luxury here. Because you have saws that'll go through bone, but not a proper bone saw that makes a real clean, non-splintery cut to eat around. No. Another very good piece. So, that one. You know when your strap, when you've reached the end of your strap, you hit that right there. There's a notch. I don't know what part of the spine that is. It's probably like the tailbone area, because from there back no. it goes back into the pelvis. No, the tailbone is back here back right there. This is, you know, and the head would have been up here. This went on to this in reverse, but, uh, and uh, so it comes down and that tenderloin comes down right to here. And uh, it's no wonder that animals don't ever let any of that go to waste. And if you guys notice that there was a little bit up there in the hip joint, there was a little bit of blood when I, in fact when you took it apart. That is because of the, the vehicle impact this animal took. Um, they killed it. It would not have uh, normally had that if it had been the one we had just butchered. So that's a pretty clean piece of spine. I, you know, there really is not enough to waste time on there, uh, especially if you got animals. This is all edible bone, and so you slice that up into pieces that uh, you can easily put in your freezer, and when you want to entertain the dogs for the night, you uh, pull out a chunk like that, and uh, you know, after we've diced it up, uh, and uh, they'll eat every bit of it. There won't be anything left. They'll eat bone and all. At this point, Clay basically duplicated everything you just saw for the other two quarters while my brother Micah and I went to starting trimming up all of the other chunks. And then as soon as he finished those quarters, Clay came and joined us as well. This is a bit time consuming for sure. Um, it went a little faster this time than some, given that this was a smaller animal than normal. But I have figured in the past, just for reference, that because we've had varying amounts of people at different times, whether it was just Clay or I, or somebody else wanted to come over and work on this as well, um, that it takes about 25 man hours total to do all the breaking down of the bigger parts, trimming all this up, packaging, grinding, packaging, etc. All of that has taken us usually about 25 hours of people work per animal, just in case you want a reference. So here is we're trimming. We've got various different cuts. Clay's working on a round steak. Mike is working on, what's he, his chunk? Front shoulder. Front shoulder, which is all gonna be burger. And what you're watching here is this sinewy layer, we are kind of peeling out of things like this chunk I'm working on is just gonna be burger. It's too small to 
make into anything else. We already cut out a bunch of the, the bigger steaks, but we're taking out any sinew bits like that, any of this um, layers between the muscles, taking out any, and on this out because of the, the road trauma occasionally, there's some bruising, like you can see a little bit on Clay's see it chunk. Right here. Right there, or on Micah's normally with a, an elk we hunt, we do not have any of that at all. Um, single heart shot drops it instantly and you get no bruising of anything else. Um, so that's not quite the norm, but that's just what we're doing here. And this takes some time and I'd say we start out being really particular and then eventually we get less particular. I would be the number one less particular. <laughs> but the less of this, you know, sinewy, silvery looking bits you have going into the ground meat, and this whole bin will then go through the meat grinder, the, uh, the less gamey it's going to taste and the less tough. And so we all sit around here and talk or listen to books or whatever we want to do that time while trimming up these chunks of meat. And then every now and then when we get the table full of trimmed up ones, I stop for a minute and vacuum seal them and get them in the freezer and, and so on. And then just keep repeating the process. So where this is all gonna get ground up anyway, that chunk's pretty cleaned up. It can go in that bin and we just keep going. What else would you want someone to know about this part of the process, boss? Um, this is uh, the tedious part and uh, that's why a lot of people don't do it. Uh, I mean, that's just being brutally honest, you know. If you took your animal to a commercial slaughterhouse, you would get all of this sinew ground up in it, right? Oh yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't take any of that. But these sinewy bits we're cutting out are going in that bucket, and then I will bag all of them into little Ziplocs and freeze them into solid lumps, and the dogs will eat every bit. So once again, there is no waste here, but we are uh, keeping that out of the ground meat. And a lot of these cuts, if you're noticing the sizes of the steaks and such as we're packaging, once again, this is a very, very small, um, you know, elk. We've normally had not yearling calves like this, and so they, everything is just a lot bigger. But this one was pretty little. And you need a paper towel to wipe, uh, you know, hair off every now and then you find a single hair. We try to pick those out, but Clay's so careful when he skins that we get very, very little of that. So that's what we're all sitting around doing. Okay, so now that we have some steaks done, what I'm doing is vacuum sealing them. I like to label the packages. This is front strap. And you can see how they're all trimmed up. The sinew bits all go into the dog food. This is almost every cut of meat you have. You have two of, because you got two identical quarters. So this is the other front strap. I could have made those bags just a hair smaller. So this vacuum sealer we've been using for years. Put that in there, make sure it's smooth. You can see it suck all the air up out of there. Sometimes they even help it massage a little bit to flatten it out. And then I'll uh, decide it's done here in a second. Takes a sec to let go of the vacuum and it's oops, it's melted a, a seal bar there. This is the other front strap. Um, and these bags seem to hold up very well. I've had very few failures over the years. I buy them as these whole rolls so you can make differing sizes for the the differing cuts of meat. And if I open the bag like that with my clean hands and clay or whoever stuffs the the meat in, then we keep the edges of the bag because like you can see a little piece of meat got right there. That would mess up the, the seal itself. So I don't want that to get into where the, the seal bar is. There they 
that one is done. No. Nope. This is what we the call the interior breakfast stuff. Steak. You don't, just don't. Now, grab that again. It was, did I see a bruise on there? Flip it open, other way. And you get the idea. These are now ready to go oh, into the freezer. Yeah. And um, when, when we actually go to grill these uh, to oh, keep it yeah, from yeah. having freezer burn, we'll actually slice it into several steaks this way then to put it on the grill. But we're leaving it as one entire piece going into the freezer. So as you can see, this is a good bit of work and it's far from my very favorite job, but I am thankful for the high quality um, food that we have to feed our household without um, the issues that come with commercially raised animals, both with their lifestyle and diets and all of that. So we are very, very thankful for this, though it's very far from my favorite chore for the year. Okay, so now we're done with the trimming part. Have the, uh, the steaks and such packaged and going in the freezer. This bucket of the good pieces we've trimmed off of. These tubs get uh, used only for butchering time. That's their only job in life. Is about to go in the grinder. And then we have a couple buckets that look like this that will all be packaged as dog food. And that's all the sinewy bits. It always looks a lot more like red meat in there than it actually is, but that's sinews and tendons and such. We are grinding a little bit of beef fat uh, to put in with, because uh, the elk has virtually no fat to it. And uh, so... This came from a local butcher shop that has extra they trim off regularly, so your friend gave it to you. Yeah. And so we're going to grind that first. We have learned when using a grinder like this, it's best to grind the fat first and then meat. Because if you do the other way, um, it tends to plug up when you do your switch. So we have learned that over time by plugging it up. So you want to grind your fat first and then your meat. And then we'll show you how we mix them. Can I turn that on? Um, you can. Mm. You're the uh, grinder lady, so... Does so that grayer stuff just taste more rancid? Then? I don't like the flavor of it, so it, it's probably fine. I just don't prefer it. And really, we're only going to grind up enough with this. You know, this meat, this fat came, you know, from. doing all the fat now we start feeding the meat through this goes so fast okay, this, this grinder can eat it far faster than you can feed it so you're going to see first come out there's last little bit of fat that the meat had to push out if you have time to freeze all your trimmy bits overnight this grinder will eat them even better pretty much frozen solid but uh, we were wanting to get this done in a single day here where it was such a small elk, so that's not coming through quite as froze clean as it would have had we had it colder. Okay, so we've got our ground fat and our ground meat in this handy uh, kind of cement mixer tool for um, this job. It's attached to the, the same grinder motor that the grinder was just taken off of, and it mixes this all thoroughly together. Now, the reason for adding fat to this is because wild game meat is so lean that if you want to, say, make a burger patty and fry it up as a hamburger on a griddle, it will tend to fall apart with no fat at all to hold it together. So we kind of just eyeball all the proportions here mixing the two together till it gets to be a, a consistency that seems to be um, something that will hold its shape nicely oh. well, was, uh, no, don't touch it okay. get your fingers away from there see i can't turn it oh because of the stiffness it's of it's hooked up to the gears i wonder why that would be i don't know so that plus 12 we got almost 21 pounds of steak 
When we were all done, we ended up with about 21 pounds of steak and 35 pounds of ground meat. Had this been a full-size adult elk, that would have been about 150 pounds of meat total instead. Well, that's all done. Clay makes his beautiful two-pound balls. He's usually really, really good at this. And yes, this is an old baby scales. Ooh. Almost got that one on the first I, try. I got it. By the, by the time he does a couple of these, he starts getting them all on the first try. Two pounds is just a convenient size for us to bag, and so that's what we do. There's obviously a bit of investment in some of the equipment pieces here, like the grinder and the vacuum sealer. They have paid for themselves many times over quite a few years ago at this point. Clay got them a long time ago, and they've been used for many, many years worth of this kind of project. And this is just packing up the uh, scrap bones for the dogs to eat later. Okay, now that we're all done and you uh, just uh, butchered your first uh, elk, uh, what did you think about? Uh, overall, it's pretty easy. You just the trimming out the sinew was the worst part, but other than that, it's like any other animal that I've chopped up. So, so we are done with that chore for the year, and uh, thankful for the animal providing us with a lot of food for quite a while for both us and the dogs and so on. So. That's the end of this. Hopefully that was helpful. If any of you guys wanted to learn more about how <clears throat> you know, to take something like a big animal and turn it into something you would recognize cooking with. But just always remember everything you uh, see on here, you know, it may not be the way somebody else does it, but it's the way I do it. And uh, it's always worked and uh, the meat tastes the same either way. And uh, it's a wonderful product. So maybe Ariel will do a video on, uh, uh, us eating a piece of this oh, particular... We already have a bunch of videos of cooking with elk over the years. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, but maybe we haven't tasted it yet, <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll do some, a little clip on how <laughs> we grill some up. good or bad it tastes. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed it. Come back next time for more adventures. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.